the most intelligent species. The way we produce food is ruining the planet, degrading the land, depleting scarce resources like water, becoming the big, biggest driver of climate change, undermining our health, and if you, as you just heard, ruining livelihoods. We actually seem to like it, as we're subsidizing this destruction to the tune of one trillion dollars a year. This is lunacy playing out at species level. Our food system is at the heart of achieving the SDGs. It simply isn't possible to keep one and a half degrees alive if we don't halt and reverse nature loss, or we cannot deliver the global goals unless we act now to radically transform our food and land use systems. A regenerative food system holds the key to all of these three goals. It's the best, fastest, and cheapest solution we have to fight climate change and inequity. Well, the moral argument is clear, but so should be the economics. The difference between the cost of inaction and the cost of action to transform our food system could be as much as $25 trillion a year by 2050. And farmers already have the solution. Many of them have been doing this for years through regenerative and agroecological practices, driving better yield with lower inputs, building carbon-rich soils, more resilient crops, and yes, getting better income as a result as well. It works. Yet, less than 5% of our food system is produced this way. Scaling this to 50% by 2030 can be done for just $60 billion a year, less than 2% of the total investment required for the transition to net zero. And the benefits will be huge. When combined with strong action on deforestation and diets, it can cut up to 25% of global emissions, sequestering up to seven gigatons per year of CO2, restoring degraded land, ensuring food security, and yes, halting and reversing nature loss by 2030. And we have a solution. It is called Regen 10, a bold collective action plan to scale the regenerative food systems worldwide in a decade. Our goal, very simple. By 2030, over half of the world's food to be produced in a way that delivers positive outcomes for people, nature, and climate. And what makes it so powerful is that it puts farmers at the center of this transition and brings together the stakeholders from across the system to empower and enable them. The alliance includes the farmer organizations, representing over one billion farmers worldwide, business organizations, representing 50% of global food production and covering over 30% of the sector's emission. Together, we will drive the alignment and convergence of existing initiatives and deliver on the three critical areas, mobilizing and enabling the global farmer community, aligning on metrics, outcomes, definitions, and data, and developing transition pathways and proof points. The goals are simple. By 2030, have 50% of the world's food produced regeneratively for just $60 billion a year. 500 million farmers paid fairly for farming regeneratively. And yes, 60 billion per year deployed to finance this transition. In the next six months, we will align a first wave of interventions to be delivered before the next COP in Africa. But to do this, we also need your help. First, build food and farming into all country NDCs. Second, put in place the policies and subsidy reforms that reward farmers fairly for good land stewardship. And finally, create the market incentives, innovation and financing to help transform our value chains. As world leaders, you have a critical role to play. We all do, not just as politicians, business leaders, farmers, indigenous people, but above all, 
as human beings. Thank you very much. Distinguished Head of State and Government, Delegates, Ladies and Gentlemen, I now open the joint fifth meeting of the COP26, the fifth meeting of the CMA16, and the fifth meeting of the CMA3. As we continue the national statement, I would like to remind representatives of the actions in place to ensure effective time management, namely the three-minute time limit for statement during this high-level segment. Please be reminded that statement should be as concise, as brief as possible, as full text of the official statement will be made on the UNFCCC website. Speaking slot for those who are not in the plenary at the time for delivery of the statement will be scheduled at, to speak at the end of all statements of the same category. Allow me to also remind you of the COVID-19 protocols to ensure the health and safety of all participants. In accordance with the UNFCCC COP26 COVID-19 Code of Conduct, participants must wear face covering except when eating, drinking, sitting in office, meetings, sitting in to perform negotiation or are medically exempt. United Nations guidance and practice recommend face covering to be a surgical or FFP2. Delegates should wear face mask while seated where social distancing is not possible. As part of the hygiene measures to ensure a safe environment of all participants, statement will be delivered from alternate restaurant. Dear distinguished head of state and government, Delegate, ladies and gentlemen, honored guests, let us begin. It is my pleasure to welcome Her Excellency, Mrs. Maya Amor Motley, Prime Minister of Barbados. Your Excellency, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. President. It is my honor to present the national statement of Barbados at this COP26. Barbados sees its obligation to address climate crisis as securing the future for our citizens and also to secure our safety from the development of a severe crisis, while at the same time we will work with others globally to ensure that we can mitigate all of the worst effects of the climate crisis facing our country and our citizens. In fulfillment of our obligations, my country has submitted to UNFCCC one of the most ambitious and action-oriented 2021 NDC updates. We hope and believe we can secure the target of pathway of 1.5 degrees within the promise of the Paris Agreement. Domestically, we will become and hope to reduce all emissions economy-wide by 70% by 2030, and as close to zero by 2035. Barbados' NDC sets an economy-wide mitigation contribution, which is mirrored in our Roofs to Reefs program, which we see as our major adaptation program. It is a multi-sectoral program across water, waste, agriculture, energy, housing, and transport. And we see it as part of a strategic transformation to adapt in the event that the world does not meet 1.5 degrees. It can be used as well as a development model for all developing countries, and we are prepared to work with all persons to improve it and to perfect it because we do not believe that we are omniscient in these matters. Barbados is also meeting its obligation to its citizens and to the citizens of the world, and indeed to the planet on which we live. 
We call on all countries to act on their moral obligation and by their actions to stop condemning those of us who live between the tropics of Cancer and Capricorn to the dystopian reality of the climate crisis. Disaster, refugee status, poverty, truncated development, compromised livelihoods, and most of all, regrettably, jeopardized lives. We have completed just recently the hosting of UNCTAD 15. Two key documents were settled, the Bridgetown Covenant and the political declaration, the spirit of Spikestown. In them, much of our aspirations are captured. We now call on the wider international community, particularly those whose high emissions are the cause of the climate crisis, to do the following. One, to help us and them move, as we know, to green economies, to allow preferential access to grants and loans for small island developing states and those other countries on the front line of the climate crisis on the basis of their vulnerability and not on the basis of GDP per capita. We ask equally that there is an increased level of capital for adaptation and that we adhere to a 50-50 split with mitigation, which is absolutely urgent because those small island developing states need it to augment water resources, to convert our electricity and our transport sector, and to promote food and nutritional security if we are literally to survive the increase in temperature. We ask also that the world consider the adoption of a multidimensional vulnerability index that is reflective of the risk and vulnerability caused by the climate induced white out risk and events that we face. We've been calling for this for over three decades and are yet to see it. But at the very least, if we don't get the index, we ask for criteria to include vulnerability. We also ask that there be a voluntary allocation of special drawing rights of the world's strongest economies in order to move forward to create a resilience and sustainability trust. My friends, the action is required now, not in the next decade. And in the words of Michael Jackson, it is up to us to heal the world and to make the world a better place. I thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. It is my pleasure to welcome His Excellency, Mr. Alexander de Croo, Prime Minister of Belgium. Your Excellency, you have the floor. Mr. President, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, climate change has arrived, and it has arrived with a vengeance. Firestorms that rage through our forests, heat waves that kill our crops and vaporize our drinking water supplies, the floods in our villages, the 41 people who died in such floods in my country last July, the first Belgian citizens who fell victim to climate change. Other countries and other continents already paid a much higher price, but for us, that was something far away, something on TV. Not anymore. Climate change is hitting home also in Europe. The report by the International Panel on Climate Change makes for a very sobering read indeed. The increase in carbon dioxide concentration and the increase in global temperature are unprecedented. The report leaves us with one conclusion only. We need a rapid and large-scale reduction of CO2 emissions to bring the one and a half degrees goal within reach. There is no time to lose. We are behind schedule and we need to pick up the pace. So we need to do more and it needs to happen here in Glasgow. We simply cannot afford not to act. We simply cannot lean back and wait for the next flood, the next heat wave, the next forest fire to kill and destroy. That is why Belgium and the European Union are undertaking action. What is Belgium doing? We are investing to remain one of the world's leading producers of offshore wind energy. We will triple our offshore capacity by the end of the decade. That will cover the electricity needs of every single household in my country. We will build an energy island 
to connect our offshore sites, a giant socket linking renewable energy production around the North Sea. We have the clear ambition to become one of the most important hubs in clean hydrogen supply. To strengthen the resilience of the most fragile countries, we are increasing our contribution to international climate finance with 60%. And we will contribute with 200 million euro to the fight against deforestation. With the Green Deal, the European Union intends to be climate neutral by 2050 and to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by at least 55% by 2030. Europe has a historic responsibility regarding climate change. That is why we take the lead. But not only the ones, we are not the only ones to shoulder that responsibility. The other major economies should urgently take equivalent action, join Europe's ambitions. They should not do so for their own benefits, because sustainability is not only a matter of saving lives, it is also about protecting livelihoods about building a new economy, creating new jobs, reconnecting with green economic growth, leveraging the innovative strengths of our companies for a more sustainable future. Otherwise, we will not get back on track to what we agreed in Paris. Now, the world is full of talent to make that happen. There are plenty of bright minds who are working on the climate solutions as we speak, in our world-class universities, in our forward-looking companies. Young people working from the garage of their parents will come up with climate solutions we're not even aware of today. We need to help people and companies to make this transition. And we need to ensure that this new economy is inclusive as well, making sure that everyone is on board. The climate transition is not only something for rich people in rich countries, because then we will fail. So everyone needs to be part of the change that sustainable technologies are affordable, that the energy bill goes down thanks to renewables, that women and men have the right skills for new green jobs. We can do this. Europe can do this. The world can do this. We either overcome the climate crisis together or we do not overcome it at all. Ladies and gentlemen, there has been plenty of time for long speeches and lofty ambitions. Now it is time for action starting today. This is not just another perfunctory summit we routinely attend. We are here out of sheer necessity and urgency. It's all hands on deck now. To do the job for which we were elected or appointed. To keep our people safe from harm, the very first task of any government, whatever its constitutional or political setup. To make our societies prosper, to make our economies reconnect with growth that is sustainable. We can still reach the Paris objectives. We have the scientific analysis. We have the technological solutions at hand. We are raising the money we need. We have the talent that is coming up with innovative answers as we speak. This is a challenge where young women and men lead the way. Now, we need to muster political will. That's why we are here. The Glasgow Conference is about political will. It is about the long-term perspective which requires action now. About making climate transition happen while no one is left behind so that we come out stronger, more resilient. The world has come together here in Glasgow. Let us find that willpower and start to turn the tide. I thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. It is my pleasure to welcome His Excellency Mr. Philippe Pierre, Prime Minister of St. Lucia. Your Excellency, you have the floor. Mr. President, I join in commending you for hosting this momentous convergence of world leaders to set the stage for the United Nations Climate Change Conference this year. As we grapple with the global pandemic, I believe our presence here is testimony to our recognition that we are at a critical juncture, a tipping point. 
This is the last decade, 2020 to 2040. The last chance to set the world on track to 1.5 degrees. The question is, will we rise to the challenge? Will our moral conscience prevail? Small island developing states as my country, St. Lucia, whose special circumstances and needs were settled in Paris are in the midst of a crisis for humanity. The UN Secretary General described the IPCC Working Group one report as a code red for humanity. Undeniably, certain changes such as sea level rise and ocean acidification are already locked in with dire consequences for SIDS and low-lying states. But we know that 1.5 degrees Celsius is still within our reach. To achieve it, we must act and act now. Countries must urgently bring forward the NDCs with 2030 targets consistent with 1.5 degree temperature goal, supported by credible net zero by 2050 long-term strategies. We must support wind, solar, and other renewable energy investments. The power to turn things around lies in our collective hands. We must be focused and resolute. We cannot wave on matters of human survival. In this regard, world leaders must deliver on the long-term climate finance goal that was promised, supporting not only mitigation, but also adaptation. We must also raise the profile of and mainstream loss and damage as a distinct pillar of climate action and support. It is high time that we complete the Paris rule book. When we bring to fruition that vital work, we can strengthen accountability and enable the highest possible ambition while ensuring transparency and environmental integrity. Colleagues, friends, we in the developing world are on the front lines, exposed. Our poor, vulnerable citizens have limited ability to respond to climate change effects and so the quality of life is significantly diminished. As responsible leaders, can we in good conscience sacrifice humanity for industry? Will we continue to ignore the science, to gamble with the future of our youth, women, private sector and NGOs? What are the prospects for countries like Taiwan, yet to be recognized, but also confronting climate change while supporting SIDS? The young people who will inherit this planet are watching. We cannot fail them. Let us not be that generation of leaders who had the last chance to set the world on track, but choose not to put people first. I thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. It is my pleasure to welcome His Royal Highness, Prince Salman bin Hamad Al Khalifa, Crown Prince and Prime Minister of Bahrain. Your Excellency, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, Your Highnesses, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. For millennia, technological and economic development moved at a steady pace. That is, until the advent of the Industrial Revolution, which set in motion profound changes for mankind, ushering in an era of change made on a previously unimaginable scale. The vast majority of humans alive in the 19th century experienced extreme poverty. Today, the figure stands at less than 10 percent. 200 years ago, half of children born died before the age of five. Now less than 4 percent suffer this fate. Our progress also led to the rise of a global order characterized by economic interdependence, which in turn brought stability to many regions of the world. Sadly, these feats, however impressive, came at a price for our planet, and our collective duty is to ensure that they do not cost us the Earth. In doing so, we must harness our productive potential with the same drive that greeted the dawn of the industrial age, marshalling the might and innovation and human ingenuity to propel a greener and more prosperous world. Emissions reductions through investment in renewable energy is certainly a central feature of this approach. 
But even as we increase renewable energy share of global demand, carbon will remain a fixture of the global energy mix for many years to come. This means that billions of tons of carbon will need to be removed and sequestered each year if we are to arrive at net zero and limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. While the Kingdom of Bahrain is responsible for just 0.07% of global emissions, we recognize, not least as an island nation, that climate change is a global challenge that requires global solutions. Developing the kinds of technologies necessary to meaningfully address the climate crisis requires us to both act in concert, but also to lead by example. Today, I am pleased to announce that Bahrain is committed to reaching net zero by 2060 and has set, in, has set a range of ambitious interim goals to ensure that we proceed without delay. By 2035, we will reduce emissions by 30% through decarbonization and efficiency initiatives and double our deployment of renewables from the targets we set at COP21. Our 2035 targets also include carbon removal solutions by quadrupling mangrove coverage, doubling tree coverage in Bahrain, and directly investing in carbon capture technologies, which we believe is essential. Forums like COP26 and the recently concluding Middle East Green Initiative serve as vital reminders of our shared interests and common future. We must take advantage of these opportunities to deliver upon the, on the, on the promises we make and have made identifying multilateral solutions that vitally are accessible to all. A future net zero economy capable of propelling humanity to new heights depends entirely on the ability of people to participate in it, both as producers and as consumers. We must therefore ensure that our work to curb emissions moves in lockstep with our work to improve livelihoods. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. It is my pleasure to welcome His Excellency, Mr. Najib Makati, Prime Minister of Lebanon. Your Excellency, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President, Mr. President, Honorable Leaders. It is with great urgency that I am addressing you today as the world is experiencing increased impacts from climate change. The track at which climate action is moving is simply unbalanced to the climate impacts to come, which is why it is crucial to act on all fronts as per Article 3 of the Convention and Article 2 of the Paris Agreement. While ensuring the delivery of the necessary means of implementation and support for developing countries to effectively participate in the race against climate change. I am also addressing you today as Lebanon is facing many challenges, including social, economic, banking, financial, and monetary crisis. Coupled with the COVID-19 pandemic, the August 4 port explosion, and the impact of Syrian refugees. Adverse climate impacts will add an additional layer of challenges and set back any improvement in Lebanese socio-economic status. Temperatures will increase, leading to long period of drought and substantial reduction of snow cover. Sea, level, sea levels will gradually rise, expected to cause massive damage to coastal infrastructure and associated economic losses. National studies estimate losses of approximately $1.4 billion by 2040 associated with the rising sea levels. Another report by UNDP points out that the total cost of climate change on the Lebanese economy is estimated to be $16 billion by 2040. Distinguished participants and colleagues, Lebanon has responded to the global call for ambition and beliefs in fighting the climate crisis through adopting a pathway towards sustainable development. Lebanon crisis have put have put us in a position of choice pertaining to the way we will recover. 
The key concepts which should be at the core of this recovery are sustainability and resilience. And it just so happens that these concepts are embedded in climate action and consequently Lebanon's updated national, nationally determined contribution. Lebanon has enhanced the ambition of its NDC by increasing its unconditional renewable energy target by 15 to 18 percent by year 2030, which will lead to at least an additional 25 percent emission reduction compared to Lebanon's 2015 NDC. Lebanon's update NDC is an important milestone for ambitious climate action in the country, which clear implications for the implementation of Agenda 2030 for sustainable development, particularly in relation to green economic growth, affordable and clean energy, food security, improved air quality, and gender equality. In this sense, these climate pledges, priorities, and organizers constitute a critical roadmap for implementation, for implementation and support. We are increasing our readiness to absorb that support, to accelerate the NDC implementation, as, as well as mainstream the concept of a green economy. We call on all international partners to positively engage with its dedicated facility to secure a greener transition in Lebanon. Lebanon will also submit a, a, a 2050 long-term strategy for low emission and resilient development strategies, which prioritize as green, a green and circular economy, a decoupling of economic growth and greenhouse gas emissions. This strategy also aims to explore how Lebanon can achieve a net zero emissions economy. Lebanon is at the forefront of countries seeking to achieve human and environmental sustainability and a supportive partner for regional and international efforts to combat climate change. Our national vision believes that the future of humanity lies in green solutions, wise management of environmental assets, and the importance of coordination between national, regional, and international green initiatives. Lebanon's beautiful nature is our most important asset, and we will act to protect and preserve our green Lebanon. Therefore, Lebanon highly appreciate the effort of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and the set of initiatives it has put forward to protect the environment and tackle the climate change challenges its keenness to launch the Green Middle East Initiative, which will benefit all the Middle East region. Lebanon is ready to cooperate and positively engage for such initiatives and stand ready to play a regional role, potentially becoming a hub in sharing its experience among the regional partners. We are encouraged to see that we are not alone in tackling the climate change challenges Inclusive and sustainable green recovery will put the world on a path to reach climate neutrality by 2050 and with it a wealth of solutions to, to, to poverty, inequality and pollution. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Your Excellency. It is my pleasure to welcome His Excellency, Mr. Sauli Nenisti, President of Finland. Your Excellency, you have the floor. Mr. President, uh, ladies and gentlemen, more than 40 years ago, in 1979, experts from around the world met in Geneva at the first World Climate Conference. In that conference, climate change was recognized as a serious threat. In 1990, the IPCC published its first assessment report that highlighted the, the global consequences of climate change. For decades, science has been sounding the alarm bell. During these decades, we have gained more knowledge. We know 
the risks. A lot has been done. The Paris Agreement was a historic milestone. And after that, many countries have set new climate goals. Finland belongs to the most ambitious one. We aim to be carbon neutral by 2035. But we have reached a point where we need to move beyond goals and pledges. Change may seem inconceivable, but only until we act. Combating climate change is one of our weightiest human responsibilities. Ensuring adequate climate finance is crucial. Finland is doing its part by almost doubling its climate finance to developing countries. By co-chairing the coalition of finance ministers for climate action, we also encourage the integration of climate action into national budgeting. Many truly impactful measures lie in this domain. As an Arctic country, Finland is particularly concerned about the fast-warming Arctic region. Everyone else should be concerned too. If we lose the Arctic, we lose the globe. In the Arctic, reducing black carbon and methane emissions is essential. No emission reduction measures will be enough if we don't take care of our carbon sinks. As the most forested country in Europe, Finland places great importance to sustainable use of forests. Every year, 150 million trees are planted in Finland. Globally, we need to strengthen efforts to halt forest loss. Ladies and gentlemen, the original title of the 1979 World Climate Conference was a conference of experts on climate and mankind. Already more than 40 years ago, we knew that climate change is the result of the actions of mankind and that it can determine the future of mankind. Now it is uh, the time to deliver on our pledges and shoulder our human responsibilities. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency.